for everybody who is very upset after reading the title. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I am not at all saying that kids are not allowed to play horror games or kids can never understand or interact with darker subject matter. I actually think the exact opposite of that and I'm hoping that'll become clear and like you'll understand what I mean the further we go into this series because it's gonna be a series. Originally the plan was to do this all in one video but I wrote the script for the first game and it was 15 pages long so it's gonna be a series and this is actually a question I've had for a while and I mean like a while. This whole question started to form in my mind back when I was still living with my parents so up to 10 years ago me and my siblings were incredibly sheltered due to my mom's religious beliefs and there was no way in hell she would have allowed us to get anywhere near this little small indie game that is now the YouTube juggernaut that is FNAF. A little something about me though is I'm a little bit of a rebel. I'm a little bit of a mischief maker, if you will, and I have been going against the church and my parents for as long as I can remember. My first year of high school was the year my mom decided she was gonna homeschool all of us. Turns out even sending us to Catholic school was giving us too much free will. Her exact words were she was afraid I was gonna become too emo. However, something about my mom. She is not a teacher. <laughs> Despite the fact that she runs the entire religious education system <laughs> in the church I was in growing up, she's not a teacher. That meant that we had to take 90% of our classes online. Having classes online therefore means you have to have access to the internet. So I was gifted a shitty little laptop computer by my grandpa. Don't get me wrong, at the time I did not know it was shitty. I thought it was the coolest fucking thing ever. So all the way back in 2014 to 2015, I had my own computer and my own access to the internet. And me, being the little shit that I was, would do all of my homework in about five minutes and then would spend the rest of my studying time just browsing through Tumblr, reading and writing fan fiction and dipping my toes into the incredible expanse that is YouTube. Now this was way before I had even heard the term let's play since I was mostly interested in like long form video essays which I'm still pretty into <laughs> because I am a fucking nerd. However the microcosm of YouTube still allows for whatever is trending to seep into every single video on the platform or pretty much every single video and that includes commentary channels. I obviously don't remember what video or even what channel I was watching that would have mentioned FNAF somewhere and I definitely didn't give a shit. Very commonly back then if I heard something I didn't understand on the internet, I kind of ignored it. A lot of memes and in-jokes I just did not understand and didn't really care to understand because I was here to learn about spaceships <laughs> and maybe a little bit of Sherlock fanfiction. And the reason I didn't really like care to like look into all these internet memes and culture things that I didn't really know about was because I would figure it out in the end anyway. FNAF is actually a good example of that. I never sought out any videos for it, but I was still able to somehow have a surface level understanding of what the game was and what it was about without ever seeing a video about FNAF. And that's why when I was in Target with my mom and my siblings, just kind of looking around the toy aisle because I have three brothers, and I heard two young boys, like around eight years old, running up and down the aisle screaming, oh my god, they've got Five Nights at Freddy's toys. Is that how kids talk? I was confused. Obviously, I didn't know jack shit about the game itself, besides the fact that it was horror and death was heavily involved. And I was pretty sure kids were the ones dying. And that game really didn't sound like it was made for kids, right? <laughs> So that piece of music that just played over the intro has of course been kind of taken over by the internet as like the jump scare you get from Freddy in the original Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, I know that piece from Carmen. <laughs> Legitimately, when I first heard the jump scare, I was like, oh, that's the Carmen music. Obviously, I didn't remember the exact name of it, but because I'm a fucking nerd, I listened to a lot of classical music, and I definitely recognized that before it was in FNAF. I listened to Carmen before it was made cool by Five Nights at Freddy's. Nowadays, I love this franchise. However, my original question from all that time ago still stands, and in fact, I've thought about it more and more, and I really have mixed feelings. There's always the question of out outcome versus intent whenever a human does anything. And you know, you can never truly know somebody's intent. They can always tell you what they say the intent is. Are they lying? Is it the truth? No one's ever gonna really know. That being said, I think sometimes you can make a good guess about intent, especially when it comes to some form of art. And talking about FNAF specifically, I definitely have some thoughts about this murderous band of robots and how they slowly change throughout time, morphing the story along with the characters. All common 
culminating in the movie. But we'll get there at the end, mostly because I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> when my friends went to go see it, I was traveling to Boston. So I do have a few ground rules that I'm gonna go over really quickly. These are mostly to like keep my thoughts organized and hopefully make this mess of a franchise a little bit more digestible. I kind of want to break it up this way, not only game to game, but also specific points in the games to like really illustrate the change in the entire landscape of FNAF that I think I've seen as it's grown. So I've broken it up in a way that will hopefully make me seem a little bit less insane and will be a more clear illustration of what I'm trying to get at. First things first, I'm going through each of the games individually. Did I need to do that? No. <laughs> I definitely did not need to go as in depth as I definitely did, but that's kind of my thing. I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I don't fit in. No, I just read really deep into stuff to the point where I can't enjoy things to the same extent that my friends can. Is this a problem? Moving on, going through each of the games individually and just the games. Yes, just the games. While I do think going into like the books and the adventure books and all that kind of shit might actually help my case, uh, I didn't read any of them and I really don't have any desire to read any of them. If I happen to reference points and like lore stuff that happens in the books and the it's a fucking activity book or whatever it's called, um, that's just because I'm absolutely steeped in this franchise and in this lore and I just know a lot of it off the top of my head and I don't necessarily remember where exactly each bit of lore came from, especially since a lot of the lore in this universe is not very well spelled out. I do want to make a video about the movie at the very very end, like I said earlier, but beyond that, we're only talking about the games. I have several categories that I'm going to talk about and I'm going to have a sliding scale that I'm gonna rank the categories on. For kids, not for kids. And when I say things like it's meant for kids, I mean like think about it in the same way that YouTube says things are meant for kids. This makes like a lot of sense if you like have ever created and put a YouTube video on YouTube. You have to click a little button that tells you whether or not it's meant for kids. If your video is not meant for kids but kids kids won't be affected by watching it, you still have to click no. This was not meant for kids. So when I say something is meant for kids, I mean it was legitimately strictly meant for kids. When I say something was strictly meant for adults, I mean something like, I don't know, fucking porn. <laughs> Here's, maybe this is a good example. Transformers, the new Michael Bay movies. They're like PG-13 and up, right? They're like not really meant for like little kids, like eight to 12 year olds. Based on the rules set by like the movie commission or whoever the fuck they are, the head movie cancel. However, the TV show Rescue Bots that my brothers loved very much is meant for kids. Grown-ups can watch it, grown-ups can enjoy it. It was meant for kids. The Transformer movies, <laughs> not meant for kids. Can kids watch it and enjoy it? Sure. Are there some jokes and themes in there they probably shouldn't see? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. There's like a pretty clear distinction about something that was meant for kids versus something that wasn't really meant for kids, but they'll watch it anyway, won't necessarily be harmed by it. Then on the very far opposite end of the spectrum, adult things that would probably harm kids if they watched it, uh, probably like Transformer porn, that probably exists. <laughs> so just because children enjoy Transformers does not mean all content involving Transformers was meant for kids. I hope this makes sense. At the very end of each video, I'm going to average together the rating that I gave each category because I love math and I have to do it in every single video. It keeps me from losing all of the brain cells that I got from watching so many hours of FNAF content. At the end, our average is gonna give us our average. Good, good point to put in immediately after talking about not losing brain cells. So at the end, I'll make like an overall judgment about whether or not that game specifically was more towards the adult side or more towards the kid side. Do we all agree to follow these rules? doesn't fucking matter because it's for me. <laughs> These rules are for me to help me understand, organize, and get my points across. Feel free to follow along and make your own judgments, but that doesn't mean you're allowed to judge my judgments. Alrighty, let's talk about the first game. <laughs> What is now the internet darling of FNAF originally started out as a demo, as most if not all indie games do. A lot of people remember that demo very very fondly, and in fact remember that first game very fondly, myself included. It was a tiny dark office filled with so much mystery seeping out of every corner, and the opportunity to uncover all of the little secrets was an opportunity that I'm sure most audience gladly clamped onto. It's basically internet legend at this point that Scott Cawthon was like pretty much ready 
ready to give up his dreams of becoming a game developer when FNAF was launched. It's kind of known to be his like last ditch effort at making a name for himself in the video game industry and I'm sure a lot of people are very glad that he gave it one last shot. But what about this game specifically kind of launched it into becoming such a cultural phenomenon? This is kind of an important question that I think does relate to the big question of is FNAF for kids? But I don't want to answer it all at once. I think looking at the other games in context with this game and a few other factors is going to be important. So while I might mention a few things here and there, I'm actually going to focus on that question specifically a little bit later on. I do however want you to like keep it in the back of your mind for now. I'll be sprinkling a few of my thoughts in here or there, so if I bring it up randomly again it's because I have something to say about it. The original game was a major launching point for this franchise, but it was also such an amazing launching point for so many YouTube careers. The culture of YouTube around that time was pretty much catered to that kind of indie game. It was first of all an indie game. <laughs> it was a game that was filled with constant, big, loud, over the top, flashy, jump scares. <laughs> constant screaming at games was like a YouTube staple back in the day and this game was full of like big, loud, scary noises, jump scares left and right and everyone could do these like big over the top reactions like oh my god the fan! Does anyone remember that meme? Was that a meme? Indie horror games were absolutely the bread and butter of YouTube Let's Plays at the time. Again, I don't want anybody thinking that I'm saying this as if it's a bad thing. It was definitely a product of its time and not particularly a video style that I enjoy watching, but I think that it really helped out a lot of YouTubers' careers, also helped out indie game developers as a whole, and I think it created this sense of community between the developers of video games and YouTubers and the people who wanted to become either or. Three scary game videos were all over the place. They're still pretty popular nowadays, but back then it was like every other video was three scary games. Since YouTube didn't focus so much on watch time, it was pretty okay and pretty common for people to only play one indie game or just a demo as a video by itself. But what specifically differentiated FNAF from like every other indie horror video game at the time? There were so many. You would get a game that's like trending for a week and then suddenly it disappears. A demo would come out and every single YouTuber would play it and then it would just never get turned into a real game. Or by the time it did get turned into a real game, nobody fucking remembered. Maybe the relevancy on YouTube has passed. So so certain YouTubers don't feel the necessity to play it again. What is so special about FNAF? Why did people continue to play it? Why did people buy the game after the demo? What was the thing? What was the X factor about FNAF? Was there one? I do think FNAF is special. I look back at that game and even though it's pretty simple and a lot of people might disagree with me, I do think something about the game itself does hold merit. I don't think that by itself was enough to launch it into what it now is, but I do think the game by itself holds up. I think this game took the genre and did something special with it, while still staying within the genre confines enough to be palatable to a general audience. <laughs> Boiled down to its very base, FNAF is a story about murdered kids. The entire franchise is based on a tragedy, one of the most horrible things imaginable. The word death isn't even allowed on TikTok, <laughs> which is why people use that stupid phrase unalived. And there's a good chance that if you say it in a YouTube video, you'll be age restricted. Talking about murder in general on YouTube is generally frowned upon by the algorithm. And I do think that is a pretty good indicator about whether or not something like this is made for kids. Now, YouTube kids does exist and there's an entirely different conversation to be had about why do we need to <laughs> censor things so heavily on a platform that isn't really meant for kids in the first place but I digress but it is a pretty interesting thing to note that the fundamental storyline the very thing the entire games or every single game is based off of it's something that's considered to be not safe for kids according to YouTube and TikTok and various other content sites and the thing is it's not like the game is just about death it's like a little bit more intense than that, right? Kids see death and like deal with death fairly regularly. There are so many Disney movies where the mom is dead at the beginning, the villain dies on screen. Hell, there's an entire Bluey episode specifically about death. But the death in Five Nights at Freddy's isn't like just death as a concept, right? It's like specifically murder. It's specifically the murder of children. It's in fact specifically a serial killer who targets and like stalks and hunts down several children. That alone is like actually pretty terrible 
unbearable and heart-wrenching when you sit with it and think about it. Adding more layers to the tragedy that is at the center of the FNAF universe, the serial killer Michael Apton, who does like these horrible things, also then takes the time to target kids in a place specifically meant for kids, in like a safe space for kids, and then like mutilates their bodies in order to hide them inside animatronic suits. And with that last point, a rational adult could start to understand that we're entering fictional territory, right? But that doesn't really take away from like how terrible this situation truly is to like really sit there and think about what these games are about, especially the first game where it's like incredibly direct that this is happening because of the murders. It's really hard to argue that this would be safe content for kids to consume. Again, a rational adult can take in the fact that there's that supernatural element added to it and like rationalize this is just fiction. Kids can't really do that as well. And I mean, that's kind of the point of FNAF. The true horror of FNAF does not come from the jump scares. It comes from the horrible atrocities that Michael Apton has committed. That's kind of the point of the games. The point of the games is how terrible of a person Michael Apton is. Not about animatronics. <laughs> the fact that children are specifically being tormented in this way is the terror of FNAF. The horrible tragedy that these children had to endure, that is the horror of FNAF. And it it makes sense that this game would be based on something so fucking horrible. It's a horror game. It's a horror game and the message might be a little bit buried, but it's definitely there. And it wasn't like incredibly hidden. It didn't take very long at all for the internet to figure out what was going on, to figure out the quote unquote lore. Adding in the supernatural element does lighten the tone a bit. It makes it palatable. It makes it a little bit more palatable for the player. It makes it, it does feel more like a game rather than just sitting down and watching some shitty YouTube true crime documentary where they just blatantly turn some of the most horrendous shit in the goddamn planet into a way to profit and make continuous content from. But I don't think there's any possible way in the world that you could convince me that I can take my scale and put it any closer towards the children's side. I think there's an argument that people will make that I put it too close towards the children's side. That being said, this is gonna be my final verdict. Is it the absolutely worst, most dirty, disgusting, horrible thing in the world? It's not in reality. Could have definitely been worse. And as stated before, I also don't think it's a bad thing to include the concept of death in children's media, but not like this, <laughs> not this one. So as a kind of like subsection to the subject matter category, I want to talk a little bit about how this horrible, terrible scenario actually plays out in the game. What kind of violence do we see on screen? Now the first Five Nights at Freddy's game is just the player character sitting in an office, looking at cameras and occasionally getting jump scared. Also, my hair got jump scared, that's why it looks this way. All of the horror elements are embedded into the fabric of the story. It's told to us through like newspaper flashes and the not very subtle but definitely vague speaking lines that come from Phone Guy. Phone Guy himself is actually implied to die at the hands of the animatronics in Night 4. I do believe Phone Guy's lines are like just barely vague enough to not really be like too much, right? This game is not gory. Really the only most violence or gore we can really point to is in Phone Guy's lines where he's explaining what the characters will do to you if they get to you. Like he goes into a little bit of detail about what the animatronics will do to you. Animatronics? I keep saying animatronics animatronics. Phone Guy's lines do go into some detail about what happens if the player loses the game and therefore dies at the hands of the pizza mascots. Are these lines like particularly horrible? Are they like extremely gory? Are they like too adult? Not really. <laughs> I mean, they're definitely lightened and helped by the fact that Phone Guy is using his customer service voice in order to deliver them to you. It helps set the tone that this game, and in larger part the series, doesn't really take itself too seriously despite the heavy subject matter. Yes, factually and very seriously, this game is centered around a tragedy, but the game allows the horror to be lightened with small snippets of comedy. Even in the first FNAF game, we start to get like a little bit of the sense of the dry and ironic humor that is now pretty much expected in the series. And that's actually what we're gonna talk about after this section. When it comes down to it, this game is just not very violent. We have definitely seen so much worse from other indie horror games and even big box store games. There are millions of kids out there playing Grand Theft Auto and seeing much worse things. <laughs> 
how many kids shoot each other in the face with Call of Duty. Hey, parents, listen to me. I'm not saying video games cause violence. What I am saying is FNAF is not the worst. FNAF is violent and gory when you sit there and take the time to picture it. Am I saying that it's okay for kids to play Grand Theft Auto? I am not. I am simply saying that is reality. The horror in this game is established through like storytelling and it's hinted to rather than giving us over the top gore and like super graphic imagery. And that I do think that this particular style of giving us the horror without the graphic side of things is one of the reasons in particular this game popped off as opposed to some other indie games. So keep that in mind. Yes, Freddy does in fact like reach out his hands to grab you when his jump scare is triggered, but I'm pretty sure the first game doesn't even have a bloody cut screen. I think it just cuts the black. Chica and Bonnie do come towards the player character, but Foxy just kind of like pokes his head out and he's like, hi, coming to kill you. But let's be real, any game that's involving violence, some mother in some Facebook group is gonna tell you, it's too scary for children. How dare children be playing this game? As if little Timmy in the next room over isn't going over to his friend's house and playing Grand Theft Auto every single day. Even despite that fact, Lego Star Wars has violence in it and I dare you, I dare any Facebook mom in the world to tell me that that game is not suitable for children. I dare you. <laughs> I dare any Facebook mom in the world to tell me that Lego Star Wars is the reason children are becoming violent. Come on now. Now, the main question, is the level of violence in FNAF acceptable for kids? I'm still gonna go with no. It's not like they're gonna be traumatized by hearing phone guys lines and in fact, I think a lot of them won't really understand the severity of it. I think they might be a little bit spooked by the jump scares. I think they might have some nightmares just because that's what kids do. But yeah, I think they'll definitely be scared. I think some adults might be scared, but I mean, it's not like it's a scary game or anything. <laughs> FNAF has a very consistent style of humor. Now, the first game is definitely not the best example of that, but the dry reading of very ridiculous statements is definitely still there. A big part of the humor of FNAF is how ridiculous this entire situation is by itself. The way Phone Guy says his lines, he is saying some of the most terrible, horrific, and also absolutely ridiculous shit in the world. Completely straight faced, completely monotone, a little bit sarcastic here and there. And this particular game, FNAF 1, there's not really a lot to say about the humor. I think the voice is still kind of being established and developed at this stage. It isn't quite at the level that we now expect from the franchise. We all now have come to expect the narrator's voice, the voice we all recognize, coming in with witty or sarcastic comments every now and then, poking at, you know, the cosmic horror that is capitalism and the way the American workforce has to <laughs> work. But back in the beginning, it was just Scott Cawthon as phone guy, gently poking fun at how ridiculous the situation as a whole was. This isn't like particularly adult humor. The dry and sarcastic tone is generally easier understood by older audiences. That doesn't mean that no child in the world is going to be confused or their jokes are going to go over their head. The humor in this game, it's not particularly offensive. It's not like dark humor. However, it is like a few steps above fart and poop jokes that kids seem to love for some fucking reason. Or at least whoever's out there creating kids media seems to think they love. I think I'm gonna put it directly in the middle. I don't think this is like particularly for kids. I don't think this is like strictly only adults will understand. And I think that later on in this series, this is gonna make a bigger difference than it does in this game. I think that brings us to like a really good point to talk about the overall tone of the game. This section, I'm also gonna talk about like the gameplay aspect as well. This is probably gonna make more sense being included here in some like later games in the series, but in order to keep everything consistent, I'm just gonna keep gameplay in this section for the first game also. The tone of this game is obviously very reminiscent of other indie horror games that came out around the same time. It's a creepy atmosphere, big loud jump scares, and it has that good old children's thing that you used to love when you were younger and like seemed really cute and friendly at the time is actually horrible and terrifying and you should be absolutely afraid of what you thought was your childhood. This of course is a very common trait in a lot of horror movies. The turning childhood nostalgia into horror is a fairly common trope. Not at all surprised to see it here. <sighs> And going back to our rescue bots example from earlier, just because something that reminds you of your childhood is in a game does not necessarily mean that that is meant for children. One of the things people mentioned about this game in particular and that what set it apart from other games that were around that time is the fact that the character stays in place. You are alone in an office controlling
rolling cameras and doors and lights. It's much more common in horror games to be like chased around. You have to run away from the monster chasing you. A lot of like quick time events or whatever they call them. Don't get me wrong. In the first FNAF game, you are being hunted. Like that aspect has not changed from other video games to this one. The difference is that in this game, you don't get the chance to escape. You cannot move. You cannot get away. You must simply sit there and wait for them to come get you. And they do. They will come get you. <laughs> you are just stuck there fighting for your life. You're on their turf. Back when this game originally came out, this was a pretty big deal. The helplessness that this first game invokes, especially when it's like not particularly similar to a lot of the other games at the time, it was a big deal. Don't get me wrong, the mechanics of the game are like incredibly simple. Even the game knows this. Phone Guy, of course, helps you learn to play the game by giving you a set of instructions. These instructions are done through world building and storytelling rather than just like beating you over the head with what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Instead of flat out telling you how to play the game, he's establishing characterization for the world and the animatronics, which also leans into telling you how to play the game. And I think it's absolutely fair to consider anything and everything that happens in the first game as world building because it's the first game. <laughs> Scott Cawthon is building his world from the ground up in this game, as opposed to adding on to a world that already exists, which is what happens in the later games. And the biggest part of this game that I like, learning to play this game is mostly done through failing. Even though Phone Guy is giving you direct instructions, since they're given in the way of explaining the world around you, there is always the chance the player is going to miss or misinterpret these instructions. And even if you're a big brain pro gamer, Phone Guy doesn't give you all the answers. He might give you the basics, but the basics are not everything you need in order to win. You learn to survive by dying. Phone Guy can sit there and tell you to not let your power go down, but until you've actually sat there and had to be in the seat and had to figure out how to properly measure how fast the power is going down, learn what actions you can take that take away from your power, learn how to properly conserve your power, find out firsthand that Foxy coming to hit your door drains a lot of your power. These are things that the player has to learn on their own. Phone Guy can tell you that it's a bad thing if you lose power, but until you actually end up doing that and get jump scared by Freddy a few times probably you're not really gonna understand what that means most likely the only way for the player to actually truly understand how to use the instructions given to them is by dying in order to really understand exactly how the power mechanic works you have to die to Freddy you can watch that little power bar go down but with a mix of other mechanics including Foxy coming and taking away a lot of your power the fact that the doors and the lights and the, even the cameras take power odds are you're not really gonna understand the mechanic in its entirety until you get jump scared. Phone Guy can give you the initial instructions, but it's on the player to actually apply those and learn from them to win. Because of the way the instructions are given and certain information is withheld, it lends itself to the player's ability to come up with strategies and theories to actually win the game. Failure is pretty much a necessity in order to succeed, and a lot of the actual true mechanics of the game are discovered by the player themselves rather than being told what to do. This game feels like it understands that the player is a smart and intelligent person that has the ability to learn as they go, that they have the ability to accept that failure is the way forward, to not get overly frustrated and continue to make progress despite setbacks, and learn and understand mechanics without them having to be explicitly spelled out for you. There's actually very little that's explained in this game, whether it be lore or how to play, it's all very vague and really only told to you once. I think that might come from the fact that this was kind of Scott's last attempt at becoming a game developer. The game itself feels complete. I think it's incredibly likely that Scott did not expect this game to go anywhere, therefore just told the complete story. I don't think he was expecting people to be constantly chomping at the bit to hear more about the story and to dig even deeper into the lore. The game was not made with the intent of launching a mega franchise that we know it is today. Can this all be chalked up to that happy accident that most game developers dream of? Uh, maybe, but I think there's more to it. All good writing is going to leave some space for the audience to have their own thoughts and opinions without leaving the them unsatisfied. This game has a heavy sense of mystery that helps aid to the creepiness since this is a horror game, and it definitely leaves people wanting to know why and how everything happened. I definitely think some of the lore that we find out later on in the games was already known to Scott at the time of the first game. I think a lot of the lore had to have been known in order to make the first game in the first place. That being said, I feel like a lot of the later games suffer from a more like JKR style of writing. That of course being um, just making a bunch of random shit up and just saying that was your plan from the 
the beginning. <laughs> and even though some of the later games can feel that way, it really does feel like Scott, or later on Steel Wool Studios, has some sort of grasp on at least where the story might be going, or at the very least where the next game might be going. At the end of every FNAF game, you are left with some unanswered questions, no matter how many questions were answered during the game. A lot of times, these are kind of expected to be answered in the next game, mostly because, and I think a good reason for that is because the first game kind of set that pattern. Scott Cawthon himself even said that every time he releases a game, a major reason he released it was to answer questions from the game previously released. And the cycle continues. The first game came out, people had some unanswered questions. The second game came out to answer those questions but brought up some new questions of its own that didn't get answered so the third came out then the fourth so on and so forth but even with all that i think that the first game by itself would have been an amazing standalone it has a complete story even though not every single question has an answer it doesn't feel like the story is lacking anything i actually particularly enjoy stories that don't have all the questions answered the story wasn't confusing but it was enough to pique everyone's curiosity the blunt and matter of fact way that the story is given to us is a good way to make this audience feel immersed in the story and the world without having Freddy come on screen and completely expose it all over the place. And the thing is, this game does have exposition. Phone Guy is just an exposition machine, but it feels like it serves a purpose and it has little twinges of humor in it. Phone Guy is the only speaking character of the entire game, unless you count Freddy's dum 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 dum, which I do not. Does this story have plot holes? Yes, of course it does. A lot of these plot holes got retconned later on, but it still has plot holes. The timeline on this thing is basically Swiss cheese. And it is a little bit annoying to have to listen to phone guys' lines over and over and over again every time you die. And again, this gets and this probably gets fixed in later games. But since we're talking about the first one, that is a very annoying thing. But does this game feel like it's for kids? I would have to say no. The tone of this game definitely feels like Scott talking to the player as an equal, as adults talking to adults. An adult would easily catch on and understand that dry, sarcastic sense of humor and the more subtle clues that are given to the player in phone guys' lines. It's not out of the realm of possibility that kids can catch on and understand these same things, but it's clear that the tone of this story is for adults. Adults are the intended audience. I don't think this game has the most adult tone in the series, but it just doesn't feel like kids were really even considered. And I'm not saying that they should have been. I see no reason for Scott to assume kids were going to play this game. He didn't expect anybody to play this game. He was a failing game developer. And while I'm sure it's safe to say that a lot of people are happy that he tried again, and is he's now happy that he's an incredibly successful game developer, there's there's just no way you can convince me that he was thinking about children in the audience when he created this game. I've mentioned this already, but if a few of these categories feel kind of random or like they're subcategories of other ones, um, first of all, they are, but mostly it's because I have a specific point or a more in-depth point that I need to make later on, but for consistency's sake, I also want to include it in this video. We can compare later on. Just because I'm not hitting this topic very specifically or heavily, or I'm like repeating things I said in other categories for one specific video or one specific game, it's probably because I'm going to say something more in-depth or more detailed about a different game. I think it's important to talk about similar aspects of every single game to compare and contrast later on. So let's talk about the villains of the story. The villains are, of course, just the animatronic. And here I'm using the term villain strictly to refer to the antagonist of the game. I'm not necessarily passing moral judgment on the souls of murdered children. <laughs> the antagonist of a story is just what is causing the like rising action of the story to happen, right? What makes the hero do their heroic deed? Even in the FNAF games as a whole, uh, the animatronics are not necessarily malevolent beings except for maybe Cassidy, <laughs> but we'll get there. They're mostly pictured as just like lost souls. So while I will be calling them villains, I don't really mean that they're like the bad guys. They're just the ones that kill you in this game if you lose. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but it's a pretty common horror trope to have something that's like childish or from your childhood be presented in a way that's not like spooky and scary. It specifically calls upon your nostalgia, what you felt like as a kid. For example, a pizza place. You might have gone to a Chuck E. Cheese when you were a little kid. Making something that's supposed to be like cute and friendly and safe for kids and then make it not that is super common to do it's super common in r-rated movies it's super common in like very scary games it's just a trope 
And while the fact that turning a childhood thing into a creepy thing isn't inherently super spooky and too spooky for kids, I would just like to remind everyone that kids get scared easily. There are so many things that kids get scared of, sometimes completely irrational things, sometimes rational things, sometimes you don't really know what a kid's gonna be afraid of until it's too late. I used to watch a lot of Doctor Who growing up because, say it with me now, I'm a nerd. I was in middle school when I was watching Doctor Who and I was still absolutely terrified of the Cybermen. Not the Daleks, the Cybermen. <laughs> it all started when I saw that tiny little flesh pile that was supposed to represent what remained of the human body or whatever, and boom, I had trauma. <laughs> Weeks of no sleep, lots of nightmares, you get the picture. That little kid, the little fucker with the gas mask? Absolutely horrifying, terrifying. <laughs> it made me terrified of my little brother. He was so young at the time, the only word he knew was mommy, and that scared the shit out of me, scared the shit out of my mom. <laughs> That's kind of my point. Kids get scared easily. Watching those episodes back now, they're like not that scary right? And honestly, thinking about, you know, animatronics is not super scary to an adult. And looking at dolls is not super scary to an adult. But to a kid who has issues already separating reality from fiction, that's going to hit them a little bit differently. The unique call to nostalgia that this particular trope in horror uses is really only going to be understood by adults. For it to be nostalgic, it has to be in your past, it has to be in your childhood. And if a kid is currently experiencing that, that's not nostalgia. Again, I'm pointing this out now so I can make a bigger point later on, but in this game, the villains are basically Chuck E. Cheese ripoffs. Really, the worst thing they're going to do is give you a jump scare, which is a little bit less inherently scary than this similar trope being seen in, say, R-rated movies. The villains in FNAF feel like a specific call to nostalgia, trying to reference your childhood to win some familiarity points. There's like a little bit of a level of complexity when we learn that they are possessed by the souls of murdered children, but beyond that, it's not like they're super deep characters. There's not really anything you can explore with them yet. That part of the world building hasn't happened yet. Are they spooky scary? Yes. Are they kind of deep and hard to understand as super complex characters? No. Is it for kids? No. <laughs> But now that we've talked about villains, let's go on to our quote unquote hero, or really our unfortunate security guard <laughs> that just happened to take the wrong job. And as of the first game, this is our main character, right? The lore and the theories that have been passed around and thought through and at some point ended up actually being true is really not something I think Scott thought about when he was first making this story. And I'm really not gonna dig into the lore very deep in this video. This is not a lore video, this is a retrospective. So I wanna look at the game as it was in that moment, not where we think it is on the greater timeline because the greater timeline sucks ass. Originally the name on that check at the end of the game is a throwaway joke and really not much more and the idea of the character just trying to make ends meet and the idea of the character just trying to make ends meet working for less than minimum wage in one of like the worst jobs in the world is immensely more funny. In my opinion it's also way more entertaining than the incredibly dramatic and lore heavy ideas that try to like tie all the games together. This isn't a theory channel and even if we end up touching on some of the lore here and there I'm just in it for the laugh. <laughs> Playing as an adult man just trying to do his job does not necessarily read as made for kids to me. In my opinion, the main character of a story is usually one of two things. An insert of the author or an insert of the audience. And before anybody gets upset with me, number one, that's opinion. And number two, if a story is well done, you can't fucking tell. <laughs> if the storyteller is doing a good job of adding enough layers to a character to make them feel like their own person and not necessarily a shell in order for you to possess, that's good writing. However, in order to connect connect with the character, there has to be some sort of relatability. Whether this relatability comes from the author pouring their own experiences into their art or them trying to appeal and connect to the audience, neither of which are a bad thing, is dependent on the work itself. And I would just like to take a minute to remind everyone, this is a spooky scary indie game. In my opinion, video games are a medium where it's more likely to have an empty main character in order to facilitate the player becoming more immersed in the game. It's more easy for the player to put themselves into an empty shell rather than a main character that has a fully fleshed out personality. In order to more easily inhabit that badass hero that the audience wants to be, the badass hero can't really have too much of a personality that goes against the player. It's going to help the audience feel like they are that character if that character is as relatable and appeals to the most amount of people possible. 
the audience wants to become the same amazing hero, but every single person is going to come from a different background, have different personalities and different experiences. If you whittle down and if you whittle down and constrain your main character too much, you run the risk of alienating a large chunk of your audience. It's really easy to just go with the quiet loner type who doesn't really talk to people and just likes to be by himself because it's easy for the audience to impose their own nuances of their own personality onto that character. The main character tends to be void of any specific personality traits, mannerisms, feelings, or even a voice sometimes. Having a blank slate character often provokes the audience to put themselves as the main character. An example of a book series that suffers from writing so bad everyone can shove themselves into the hollow shell that is supposed to be the main character, Twilight. Legitimately a character so bland and boring and plain that any teenage girl can pretend that she's the one in the lead role, <laughs> going on amazing adventures with her sparkly vampire boyfriend. Even the fact that Jacob and Edward are fighting over Bella in the first place feels like self-insert fanfiction, and it serves the same purpose, to make the reader feel like they're the one having the amazing time, not the actual character. Star Wars also has this problem. What even is Luke's personality? The chosen one? That's not a personality trait. He's just there for the audience to think that maybe one day they can also become a Jedi. They are cardboard cutouts of actual people so that anybody can put their own face through those weird holes that they have at like the photo op things at carnivals. This greatly helps the story appeal to a wider audience, therefore making all these examples extremely popular. This could possibly be another thing that led to the success of FNAF. You can't love or hate a character that isn't even really a character. Pretty much every single player will have a completely neutral reaction to the person they are pretending to be. And the person the audience is pretending to be for this game isn't like a cool space wizard and isn't a girl who has vampires and werewolves fighting over her. No, you're inhabiting the mind and body and soul of just a blue collar worker. <laughs> You're the night shift security guard for a children's entertainment facility. If I had that job in real life, my grandma would scream at me to get a real job. <laughs> That's a real thing that happened to me. <laughs> you don't even get a gun in this game. You're a security guard that doesn't even have a weapon. <laughs> not American enough. This game takes place in America. <laughs> you're on the night shift. It's not like kids are gonna get hurt, but you're left with no way to defend yourself or even be proactive against the hell you're facing every night. Kids don't wanna embody that character. Hell, most adults don't wanna embody that character. It hits a little too close to home. It's just a little bit too similar to real life. You aren't cool. You aren't a badass. You're there because you have to be out of necessity. You're just an average Joe who needs to make rent and you just so happen to end up with one of the shittiest jobs possible. And that is wildly funny. And I really don't think that's ever going to mean the same thing to a child that it does to an adult who's had to live that experience. This speaks to the person that's actually had to stay in a hellhole of a job because they needed to make rent. They had to stay in a place that sucked ass against their better judgment, against your friends constantly telling you to get the fuck out of there just because you have to keep a roof over your head and you have to get groceries. And at the end of the day, your entire life relies on that measly paycheck that you get at the end of the week that you know isn't really enough for what you're doing and you know for a fact you're getting underpaid, but you would be laughed out of the room if you went to your boss's office to ask for a raise. The main character, and therefore by proxy the audience, is an adult. Similar to the villains in this story, our hero is not particularly deep. It's not like no kid in the world can know what it's like to work a shitty job. <laughs> I'd still push the scale t more towards the adult side because I think it's so much more funny and so much more relatable to somebody who's actually had to live that experience. Obviously not this exact scenario, most people are not being hunted down by animatronics haunted by children, but something similar. And in order to help make the bigger point, I have a few random thoughts I want to point out. First of all, the second question on Google when I was trying to look up some stuff for the FNAF series as a whole, it was, was FNAF real in 1987? So, and if that doesn't convince you that kids are heavily involved in the FNAF franchise by now, I'm not really sure what will. There's absolutely no scenario in my mind that can convince me that an adult looked that question up. Another thing I want to mention, uh, the setting of this game is basically a Chuck E. Cheese. We talked a little bit earlier about just because childish things are involved in the story doesn't necessarily mean it's for children. This particular facility is especially dirty and dark and dingy. Even this like silly cute decorations they have up on the wall are like creepy as fuck. Just like the things we mentioned earlier, this is just feeding into that trope of taking our childhood nostalgia and making it scary. Just because it's set in a place that makes sense for kids doesn't really mean that kids should necessarily be playing the game. The original game, FNAF 1, was released in 2014 on Steam. 
Now Steam to me seems like a site that's really meant for adults, and I obviously don't mean it in that way, but it does require you to have a credit card number in order to buy games. And even though I know kids are either going to steal their parents' credit card or convince their parents to buy it for them anyway, the fact that the game was released on Steam kind of feels to me like Scott Cawthon knew his audience were going to be those people specifically seeking out indie horror games. Adults. But that begs the question, how did kids even find out about this game? It's not like they're lurking around on Steam looking for the newest indie horror. How do they get their grimy little hands on the game to start playing it for themselves and therefore completely merging into the fandom to the point where they're selling the little plushies and action figures of these murderous animatronics right next to the Legos at Target? I think the answer is YouTube. I think YouTube not only helped launch FNAF into the mega giant that it is today, but I think it also greatly influenced the change that happened in the audience. I'm hoping that as these videos continue, you'll be able to understand why I think that while it might not have started out as a kid's game, FNAF might be for kids now. I think it's pretty safe to say that the original Five Nights at Freddy's was absolutely not intended for children. The whole vibe of the game feels like an adult talking to adults. The humor is sarcastic and meta, the main character feels very relatable to the player, the villains in the setting call to nostalgia and play on very similar and usual horror tropes. Even though the game isn't particularly graphic or gory, the storyline is something that parents would absolutely be upset about if their kids happened to see on TV. I do believe that kids definitely embrace the story as soon as they found out about it. A mix of the YouTube YouTube hype, wanting to fit in with the crowd, wanting to feel older and more mature than the kids around them by playing games that weren't really meant for them, that feeling of rebellion that you get when you're doing something that you know you're not supposed to. While they might not have been as widely spread in the community back then, kids were definitely on the horizon. The same can be said about that explosive growth that FNAF was about to have. Both these aspects seem to feed off each other in a way that I don't think anyone, least of all Scott Cawthon, was expecting. However, Five Nights at Freddy's was and is a good game. Kids and adults alike have the ability to appreciate good games and deserve good games. On top of that, communities tend to grow around good games. This game is an amazing start to this series, but I think it's fairly safe to say that at this point, FNAF had no intention of having children in the audience. I'm not saying Scott Cawthon made a game that was strictly and only for adults, no kids allowed and all that. I think he was just making a game that he would like and that people like him would like and that would fit in with other popular games at the time. That just is a game intended for adults. If FNAF had died here, this would have still been a good game with an interesting world and an intriguing story. It could have ended here and it would have felt complete. FNAF grew like crazy though, and I think that directly affected the audience it has, and therefore the entire vibe of the franchise. It seems almost like a cycle. The more FNAF grew, the more children were in the audience, and the more children were in the audience, the more FNAF changed to fit that, therefore bringing more children to the audience and growing more. And we'll get to all of that eventually. But as of right now, I think that pretty accurately covers the first game. FNAF is still a big hit on YouTube and is still continuing to grow despite the many times people thought it was over but just like William Afton it'll always come back. Thank you all so much for watching this video I hope you enjoyed it and weren't weirded out by how much I know about the FNAF franchise. <laughs> be on the lookout for the video that's going to be covering the second game and the millions of other videos that come out after that but that's all I have for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye! Dum 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 d